last flight that you had, which uh, you went in SETI. I was just curious, any work related to SETI happening at JMIT? Uh, actually, not much. There are other radio telescopes which do a fair bit of SETI work, some which are actually dedicated for SETI. We have been talking about it. We are in some discussions with uh, some collaborations for uh, doing that, but right now we don't have a SETI program at JMRT. Uh, good evening, sir. So, you mentioned pulsars and how their beams are directional. Like, how are they directional? Like, what makes them directional? Why don't they just go all over the place? So, um, one of the things that makes radiation direct directional is uh, beaming, relativistic beaming, uh, which uh, is the reason why those uh, jets from those radio galaxies are again, you know, they are jets, uh, they are going off uh, uh, and so the charged particle that is uh, uh, radiating uh, that instead of uh, it being an isotropic beam, it gets beamed in the direction of motion, that comes from relativistic effect. In the pulsar, they, people do believe that at some point the, the radiation is probably still beamed, but the fact also is that these uh, charged particles which we believe may be causing the radiation are actually confined to the polar regions of the magnetic field for reasons which I can't go into very easily here, but um, and, and you know once that is understood, uh, then that gives the extra uh, confinement that it is uh, 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 it's, it's a torch where the beam is, is confined to what is called the open field line region of the magnetic field and uh, that gives the overall um, uh, confinement and so uh, you see that uh, torch light only when it passes by. Within that, when the individual particles or bunches of particles are emitting, that, that radiation itself is further beamed and uh, then you will see that as and so when you look at that shape in detail, when you look at individual pulses, very high resolution microseconds in time, then we find short, short blips of uh, emission which it is. Uh, so, it is like, uh, it is like a LED uh, torch light rather than a single lamp torch light. So, if you have multiple LEDs, each is glowing and each of them will give you a small beam as it sweeps by and, uh, uh, and, and that all of that. Uh, so, the one part which is the confinement of the overall shape that comes from the magnetic field, the other one where inside it there will be sh shots that comes again from the same, uh, possibly from the same relativistic uh, effect. Um, so, in the, uh, this uh, Y shape uh, aperture synthesis technique, uh, my uh, question is that um, <coughs> how is that? Uh, thought of to be an accurate uh, kind of reduction of the signal that would have been collected yeah. if there was something like an optical telescope. Yeah. So, the, well, if something that was a filled uh, thing which huh, had huh. Uh, you know, no gaps, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it will still be a radio, but it will have no gaps in it. Yeah, that's what and so, the, basically what happens is there are two things. One, uh, you make a configuration where, like I said, the aim is to, if you think about assembling an image in the other domain, you must have enough sampling in that domain. So, you want to collect as many points in the Fourier domain as you can, which means and each Fourier point comes from just the fact that lambda by d uh, of the separation between the antennas. So, you make a configuration where you get uh, maximally possible uh, separations, number one which is why the Y shaped is one of the preferred configurations for if you have n antennas and you solve the problem how should I distribute them to maximize the number of Fourier components I can measure, you will find that Y is one of the solutions. Now, even when you do it, uh, you will not get infinite number of Fourier points okay? and uh, they will be missing Fourier points in the Fourier domain and you say well, how can you reconstruct the image with missing information. Now, that goes into uh, issues which are related to, um, uh, there, so there's, uh, there are different techniques that are employed like uh, things like maximum entropy methods and so on where there are certain assumptions made about the property of the image. For example, the fact that it is positive definite, its intensity so it will not have negative points, it has to be always positive and that if there are uh, the well behaved sources will be collections of points, uh, you can model them that way. Uh, so, there are certain assumptions that go in and with those assumptions, then you can invert this problem and solve it. Uh, and there is enough debate as to have you got the, the right answer, uh, but generally it has been shown that yes, do you get something which is 
very very close to the correct answer. Okay. Yeah. Question there. Uh, and, yeah. Sir. So I had a question regarding uh, pulsars. So uh, pulsars have really strong magnetic fields and they also spin very fast. So why isn't uh, the spin and the like the magnetic fields aligned? And also why is it so strong? Why is the magnetic field so strong? Okay. So the uh, magnetic field is strong. Uh, I'll give you the one simple uh, answer for that. So uh, the, the birth of a neutron star is associated with the uh, oh, yeah. collapse of the core of the original star which undergoes a supernova explosion and the core collapses because of uh, gravitational pull because the original uh, mechanism that the star the energy that the nuclear reaction that the star was producing to keep it in balance is gone and so uh, and when that happens the object is effectively contracting and that's why the density goes up and if you uh, talk, if you conserve, so the original star had a magnetic field, the sun has a magnetic field, uh, the earth has a magnetic field. So when that collapse happens, if you conserve magnetic flux, you can ask under what conditions uh, magnetic flux should be conserved, then you will find that the field strength keeps going up, B goes up. And therefore, that's one simple minded uh, understanding or explanation of why they end up with such high magnetic fields, just like they end up with very high densities because you are just compressing the material. So, if you conserve uh, flux density, then you are, you are also increasing the magnetic field strength. Now, why the uh, uh, field is not aligned to the rotation axis is less clear. Um, and it, but it is not unusual. Uh, even the Earth's hmm. uh, magnetic field is not aligned to the Earth's rotation axis. Uh, it has to do with the uh, internal dynamics of how it uh, was born and supernova explosions are still not very well understood in model phenomena and people believe that small asymmetries uh, in during the explosion can do various things including you know tilting the whole uh, magnetic field uh, to a different angle from where it has got the maximum angular momentum uh, during that collapse. because again the reason why it spins much faster is again same thing angular moment is conserved of the original spinning star and so, as you compress it, it starts hmm. spinning faster and faster. So, uh, so there are simple minded answers to this, but it is not necessary that they are the, the, the correct or final answers. Also, uh, so neutron stars are like magnetic fields are generated by moving charges, right? So, but uh, neutron stars are composed of neutrons. Yeah, so now you have to go inside the, there is supposed to be a super fluid. Um, uh, this uh, thing inside there and there is something called vortices in a superfluid and then you can get fields trapped in vortices. Uh, so, I, uh, so it is a fairly complicated story, but there, there are models which can explain how you can uh, preserve that strong field uh, in an object which you think is just got neutrons in it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. See, I have a question here, uh, the second. Yes. See, you mentioned all uh, all of these objects are wide band uh, emitter in the whole frequency. But when you represent the picture, the picture we see, how do you take that wide band um, emission and plot it for us to see? Right? How is the image created? Yeah, uh, that's that's an interesting question. So, it it depends on what's happening. Mm -hmm. So, in in any wide band emission, uh, you know, there's a spectrum. So, like if uh, the, you know the uh, so. What you have to do is you have to analyze the data carefully, understanding how to process it at different parts of the wavelength over the wide band that you are uh, required. And then you, uh, if the property of the object has not changed significantly over that range of frequencies, then you are allowed to collapse all of that and make one image. But there are times when the property of the object can change significantly over that wide range of frequencies, although it is emitting. Uh, and typically, the simplest thing that changes is the strength. So, it may be stronger at this end of the spectrum and weaker at the other end of your band and you have to worry about it. How do you analyze it? How do you represent that? Uh, it's, some other properties can also change uh, across that range of frequencies. So, you are right that uh, it is not that straightforward, but in, under certain conditions, you can collapse all of that and make one image. When you can't, then you make images which are called slices, that there will be a corresponding image at, at uh, regular intervals across that range of frequencies. Okay, but thank you.
Yeah. So even with radio telescopes, uh, what you can see, I mean, see within quotes, uh, is a small fraction of the entire spectrum. Is there or has there been any speculation about what you would discover if you were able to cover the whole spectrum, you know, the, radio, the, the entire spectrum? You mean the entire radio spectrum or the entire electromagnetic spectrum? The entire electromagnetic spectrum, because there's a huge part which you cannot see or which, you yeah. know. I mean, it's easy to speculate. <laughs> Speculations are there, but you can ask what is known. So, uh, like I showed few examples, like the Andromeda galaxy. There are a few objects which have been studied in that much of detail over a wide range of the electromagnetic spectrum and as you could see they change dramatically um, and uh, you can then combine all that information to understand better the physics of what's going on. Um, in some cases where you see the object only at in some limited parts of the spectrum, you can speculate what happens to it uh, when, uh, when you don't see it and that happens in pulsars. So you ask well you see them in the radio but they don't shine in the optical. Okay, so you ask what happened. So then that feeds into that theory of which is trying to explain the origin of the radio emission. It's a constraint that yes, this mechanism uh, will be efficient only in the radio wavelengths and it will fade away in this manner or it should fade away in that manner and that helps to constrain the physics of what is happening there. But you know, you, you can't just, I mean you can speculate but finally you have to tie it to an observation or to a physical model of Maybe some phenomenon. thought experiments or you know if somebody has <laughs> done that. It's, it's difficult because uh, you know unexpected things keep popping up which right. uh, you thought that well, yeah. I never thought that such a thing uh, exists in the universe. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Good evening sir. Uh, so my question is related to the effect of you know gravitational lensing if we at all have on radio waves and how do the you know our GMRT telescopes and other telescopes worldwide they uh, correspond you know they understand that gravitational lensing and they you know how do they reflect that so that's a good question I'm just thinking about any example that we know in radio of gravitational lensing there aren't uh, there are not many there is other kinds of lensing that happens yeah so when yeah, for example for gamma rays and all yeah you know. but uh, so when, uh, you know, the basically lensing is that whenever the electromagnetic signal is passing close by to in a strong gravitational field, it gets uh, uh, bent yeah. and, uh, and uh, we see it in a different way. So like these pulsars that I was talking about, often they come in binaries like uh, two, neutr two stars going around each other, one of them is a neutron star, both can be neutron stars and so on. And when the radio wave from uh, the neutron star is going uh, the orbit is such that you are seeing the pulsar from behind then the radio wave is going to cross nearby to the companion star and then gets bent right. and you can actually see that the pulse will arrive a little bit late or a little bit early compared to the time you were expecting it because its path has been um, bent uh, exactly like gravitational bending so you can you know that's the analog of gravitational bending that we do see the other kind of gravitational bending which you see spectacularly in optical images, uh, we don't have too many of the equivalents of those in radio images. Uh, wait, just one final thing. Uh, so in the radio spectrum, you can, can we get the composition of the, for example, if uh, when you're looking through exo solar planets or so, you know, can, do we get the composition of the, you know, the materials like, uh, we can get that. Right? So as you saw, when I talked about what produces radio waves, uh, they, they at most, so, so most of those are, uh, you know, charged particles, okay, uh, plasma and so on. So the composition business is uh, not very relevant there. When you detect spectral lines, then you can detect atoms and there are molecular species which emit spectral lines which you can detect and uh, then you can talk about composition, uh, but that's only when uh, species has uh, at a transition, whether it's electronic, rotational, vibrational, or whatever, which gives you a band in the radio. Uh, so it's not a very good technique, uh, radio, for decomposing uh, the, you know, working out the composition. Uh, like you can do that uh, much better from the optical spectra, which give you much more information about the constituent uh, atoms and molecules. Okay. Yeah, just a great amount you can get from.
from radio. Yeah, just like these high type and high trend spectroscopic databases yeah. are created on the basis of those. Uh, yes. But you know, the, like what I mentioned about in the SKA context of looking for complex organic molecules. So, certain amount, uh, certain number of these complex molecules have been detected using radio waves. Uh, but if you say, well, I look at extra solar planet and can I get its atmospheric composition? That is much harder in radio. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, uh, let's try to wrap up the evening. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for coming for this Homi Baba Memory Lecture. And thanks a lot to Professor Yashwant Gupta for taking the time to uh, give this talk. Uh, let's have a round of applause for Yashwant.